Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Bienvenidos a todos. Karispera sas, as we say in Greek. Hope you all are doing well wherever you are. Uh, my name is Ethan Marcus. I'm the Director of Communications for the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the national umbrella organization for the Latino-speaking Sephardic community of the United States. We're so excited to have you all here with us tonight with the wonderful Marsha Haddad Economopoulos, the Museum Director of Kehila Kedoshiyanana Synagogue and Museum. Um, this is through our joint program, a special joint program between our two partner institutions, through our Sephardic Digital Academy, an online database of wonderful other programs and classes on a host of other topics, ranging from Latino language and culture, Sephardic cooking, Greek Jewish history, um, Sephardic Torah, Halakha, and so much more. If you're interested in learning about our other programs or potentially sponsoring a program in honor or in memory of someone in the future, please feel free to reach out to us. You can check out our website at SephardicBrotherhood.com or shoot us an email at info at SephardicBrotherhood.com. We're here tonight, like I said, with wonderful Marsha. Just a little bit about Marsha, for those of you who don't know, um, this really institution in the, in the Greek Jewish community. Uh, Marsha has served as the Museum Director of Kehila Kedosha since 2004 and sits on the Board of Trustees of the Synagogue and Museum. She also serves on the Board of Directors of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative and is president of the Association of Friends of Greek Jewry. She was born into a traditional Sephardic Jewish family from Salonika and has devoted her life to telling the story of Greek Jewry as an author, translator, editor, and lecturer. She holds two BAs, one from Brooklyn College in Psychology and the second from Queens College in Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, plus two MAs, first in Psychiatric Casework from the New School and second in Italian from Queens College. Without further ado, for part one in our wonderful new uh, uh, exhibit of Greek Jewry, Marcia, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Um, in case you don't know where I am, I'm on the road to Zagoria. I've got one of the iconic bridges behind me. Uh, we always try to include that in our tours because it's such a beautiful, beautiful part of Greece. I want to welcome all of you. I want to thank Ethan and the Sephardic Brotherhood. I want to thank all of those who sponsor and attend these lectures. Um, this is really, I enjoy this so much. I really do. I enjoy seeing all the people that are out there. So many of that I know and hold dearly. And Barry Mionis, how are you doing there at the end? I just saw you pop in. Uh, it's like it's like having a big holiday festival with seeing all the people who are dear to me in my world. Okay, today, let me open up my PowerPoint here and um, get this going. Okay, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about the exhibit memories. Uh, this is the world that they left behind in Greece the world they found here, and their journey over. This uh, exhibit has been up for a number of years uh, because it gives me the ability to work around so many themes. The world they left behind. Most of our people came over at the beginning of the 20th century. Actually, the first immigrant to arrive from Yanina was Zakaria Yamtav, who arrived in 1899, although there are some possible earlier immigrants, but uh, they don't really fit into our traditional Romeo Yanida world. They were leaving behind a world that was very different from the world that they would find here. The reason that I'm um, doing this, these series of Zoom presentations because of course the museum has been closed for a while now, but this gives you the ability to see what we have and actually go into greater depth than you would if you came in for a typical visit. By analyzing the world they left behind and comparing it to the world they found here, we can step into the shoes of the early immigrants and see what they experienced. I want you to envision being a Jew from Yanina at the beginning of the 20th century, the most iconic period, not only of immigration, but of change in this part of the world 
in impetus was from 1900 to 1914. Why? Yanina became part of modern Greece in 1913. And you can see here the changes in maps. This was before 1913. I'm sorry to make sure, interrupt, Marcia. We're just having some trouble seeing um, the, the PowerPoint. Just make sure it's uh, screen shared. Oh, did I not share it? Okay, well, hold on one second. That's probably, I'm sorry about that. Thank you for telling me that. I would have no gone problem. on and, okay. There you go. Okay, so we'll flip through this um, real fast. The world they left behind. The most iconic part of this period was from 1900 to 1914. Not only did a good portion of the immigrants come over, uh, but also the changes that were taking place. Here you can picture Albania on the map here and Greece. There was no Albania before 1913. That's when the border was set. And bear in mind, the setting of this border had nothing to do with language, culture, or traditions. It was an arbitrary border, and you found many Greek-speaking Jews or Christians living in what would become Albania, and many Albanian Muslims living in what would become the borders of uh, this particular border of Greece. Here you can see here the division of Albania in this one over here. What was the world they left behind? It was very much influenced by the Ottoman Empire. There were Turkish speaking citizens in Yanada, Greek speaking Christians, and of course, the Jews who spoke a dialect that was a mixture of Greek, Hebrew, and Turkish. It was reflective of the world that they lived in. I want to compare their experiences, not only of the world they left behind, but the world they found here, and see how different it is from other immigrants of the same period, both Jewish and non-Jewish. The world that these Yanoti immigrants were leaving behind was basically a rural world. Although Yanina was a, a city at that time, it was not the city that we now see. Um, their, their lives from, uh, for many of them extended outside the borders of the city of Yanina, up into the mountains. There were Jews in Yanina that actually had flocks of sheep. Uh, cows, they were involved in the dairy industry. This, these are not Jews, but these are typical peasants of the, of the uh, era. And you can see the, the difference of what their lives were like in comparison to citizens in other parts of the world. These could be Jews, but they're not. My iconic picture of Yanara, which doesn't change the mist coming up in the city, it's on a lake. Because of the changes in borders, it not only changed the experience of their lives within the city of Yanara, but also it affected the route that they would use to come over to the United States. This is a market quite different from the markets they would find on the Lower East Side. What I want you to bear in mind also is we are now commemorating the 200th anniversary of Greek independence, 1821. Yanina was not independent from the Ottoman Turkish Empire in 1821. They would be part, and I'm using these are political terms now, they would be under the yoke of Ottoman oppression from 1430 until 1913. The relationship, this happens to be Dr. Kofinas here with a Turkish friend of his. The relationship that they, the Jews had with their Turkish neighbors was really quite good and relatively, <clears throat> excuse me,
<clears throat> relatively speaking, compared to other parts of the world, quite good with their Christian neighbors. Simply put, they did not have economic competition. So they had their own separate little part of the world. Uh, the Jews were mostly involved as shop owners, mostly with textiles, and of course, supplying the needs of the Jewish community. The Muslims were the bureaucrats. They were in charge of the running of the city. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. And the Christians had their own particular place within, within the borders of the, of the city. This is a taverna, actually a Jewish-owned taverna in the city. A wedding. The weddings would flow out into the streets. This is another wedding coming out from the Castro. Simply put, everybody in the Jewish community was invited. Um, someone would go around and announce the wedding and invite whoever, uh, the family of Saul Solomon and the family of Eftekia Nachmias are inviting the whole Jewish community of Yanada to their wedding. This is a side street in Yanada. This is a typical street, not too far from the um, Holocaust Memorial. The houses were close together. The houses were simple, mostly made of wood. This was not a wealthy community, although there were some beautiful houses that were owned by the more wealthy members of the community. Another side street. Uh, this is actually right bordering the Castro, the fortified area. Very often there's a misnomer there. They call it the castle. It's not a castle, it's a fortified area. In Greek, it's Fortio, the fortress. This is a wealthy family. This is the family of Nisim Levi, and this was the Levi's residence here. Now, if you look up here, the men are wearing turbans. It was part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and Jewish men would wear turbans. Underneath the turban, turbans would be their kippot. The rabbis were traditional. The occupations ranged from shop owners, merchants, mostly involved in textiles, and to a man who made his living actually bringing water in from the wells outside the city. There were two synagogues in the city before World War II. This is the new synagogue that was outside the Castro and was destroyed by the Germans and does not exist anymore. This, I love this picture because you can actually see what the synagogue, the old synagogue, Kehila Kadosha Yashan, the synagogue that was probably built on the site of pre-existing synagogues in the city. But you can see the walls outside. You can see the structure of the synagogue inside, the entranceway. This is where the sukkah would be. And you can see where the one of the uh, beamers, the main beamer would be, and you can see it from the outside. The tall Ottoman style windows that would bring natural light into the synagogue. This is the interior of the synagogue. But the, this chandelier, by the way, was given by the Ashkenazi family to the synagogue. And there's a little sign that hangs underneath uh, proclaiming their donation. This is the main beamer here. This would be used for Shabbat services, high holidays, definitely bar mitzvahs. There was another beamer in the center, positioned over here. And this is the, uh, the uh, Echal, the Aron, these were where the Torah scrolls were kept. You know, someone had once said to me, God, this must have been a very wealthy community. Look, the uh, Aron is made out of marble. Marble was very cheap in that area. If you go along the roads outside of Yanara, you'll see the, the mines where the marble is taken from. And the iconic lake. This is not one of the more beautiful pictures of the lake, but the lake was so much a part of the life of the city. 
the children would go fishing in the lake. The Jewish children would have trips from their school going to the island on the lake. The women would wash their clothing in the lake. Every Yanoti has a tale from their nonas and the papus about the lake. The uh, clothing would be hung reflected in the lake. This is a central market here. So you can see the world is quite different from the world that they would be coming to. It was a simpler life. Women didn't work for the most part. In fact, it was considered a shame if their fathers or their husbands could not support them. A woman did not go out and go to the market. You did not see any women here in the market. The men did the shopping because a woman was not to come in contact with a man that she was not married to or related to. Purim, we just had Purim. This is a traditional Purim actually in the synagogue outside the Castro. And this was the most popular holiday in Yanina. Um, the most popular name for a woman in Yanina was Esther in all its forms. Esther, Estherina, Esterula, Estella, uh, Astro, Teru, which was a dialect or form of Esther. And Mordecai was a very popular name, not only as a first name, but as with many Yanoti Hebrew first names, it became a surname also. The iconic lake. Their journey over, I've done quite a bit of research about what that journey was all about. I'd like to get rid of some misconceptions. First, let's start at the beginning. The first Yanotis to come to the New World, most of them left from a port in Albania called Vore. And uh, why? If you look at the map of Albania, and the port city of Vlore and where Yanra is, you could walk right across. They didn't leave from Patras because the Corinthian Canal had not been dredged deep enough for the steamships to come in. So they took transport from Yanra, probably horse and carts to the port city, and then they would go over to Italy. And from there, they would wind up at a city in Italy, usually either uh, Palermo or Naples, and come to the New World. Or when a ship company offered half fares, a number of the Yanoti Jews, including Leon Colchimero, went to Cherbon in France. That particular company that year, and it was in 1905, I believe it was, offered half price, and a good number of the Jews from Yanada could not turn down this bargain. Actually, uh, Leon Colchimero came over initially with his wife, um, Julia, and then she had left behind two young sons. She went back to bring the sons over along with her mother-in-law and it was not until later that the other brothers would come. Although the first of the Culture Merrill brothers to arrive in 1903 was Elias Culture Merrill. He was the youngest in the family. When you talk about immigration, who could leave, who would come? Sometimes it had to do with money. This was, you know, most of the time they had to save up the money for this trip. This was going to be a once in a lifetime trip. Also, what were they leaving behind? Matathias Culture Merrill was the oldest son. His responsibility was to take care of his aging parents. He was actually the third brother to come. Asher would, would die. He would never come to the United States. He would die in Albania, and his widow would come with eight children later on. So so much of the possibility of leaving 
had to do not only with a desire to find a better life for yourself and your children, finances, and responsibilities at home. With the Coach Merrill family, and I, I point this out not only because Elliot is here and a number of the other Coach Merrills, but I've done such extensive research and it's so representative of what life was like in the city of Yanada, what their journey was like and what they found here. So much of the impetus for early emigration, leaving from Yanada, had to do with archaic uh, laws of inheritance where everybody in the family inherited equally. How do you start out in life as one of 11 children, as Leon Cochamero was? How do you support your new family? You want to find a place where you can make a life for yourself and your children. The dowries. Older brothers had to provide dowries for their children, for their um, sisters. In a family of 11, where there were four sons and seven daughters, this became a burden. And if we look down the pecking order of the Culture Barrow family, we can see what happened if you were unfortunate enough to be at the bottom of the pecking order as a daughter. One of the most esteemed representatives of our community, Ray Dalvin, her mother was a culture marrow. Her mother, Esther, married uh, Israel Dalvin, who was almost 20 years her senior and not the best prospect, but he wasn't asking for a dowry. It probably was not the happiest of marriages. There were also two women from the community who married men from Castoria, two brothers who had come into Yanana. Isaac married Hanula, Cochimero, and they came over, actually Elias Cochimero came over with his brother-in-law Isaac Cohn and his sister Hanula in 1903. Isaac uh, Cohn didn't ask for a dowry. So that's probably the reason that Jasula, Hanula's father, allowed her to marry this outsider. According to family law, he had to prove himself. But it's certain he probably had a sigh of relief that that was one less daughter that he had to provide a dowry for. Here you can see where the port of Albania was and what the port looked like at the time that the early Jews from Yanina left. This is another picture of the city of Bora. There were other cities um, in Albania where Jews settled. In fact, many of those that settled in Albania when the, what, during World War II who were still living there, those Jews survived because the Albanian Muslims saved the entire Jewish population of Albania. It was not until later on, after 1906, seven, that we find the Jews leaving from Pasada. Now, here you can see where Vore is in Albania, Yanina, certainly a short trip, and to Pasada. The greater majority of Jews from Yanina left from the port of Pasada. There were a few that left from Piraeus, but mostly they were Jews that came from the eastern part of Greece and not the western part of Greece. I often try to envision what it was like for these insular Jews who had never, most of them had never been out of the confines of the small city of Yanina. Most of them had never met anybody who spoke a language other than Greek or Turkish or um, their mix of Hebrew, Turkish, and Greek. The ship company that left would leave from Trieste, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, so the crew on the ship spoke Hungarian, Austrian, or Italian. So try to envision these poor crew members as they made their way down the coast to the port of Pasada, where that would be the next place where the ship would land 
and there would be Jews and Christians getting on board who spoke Greek. I can envision the captain calling out, okay, who here speaks Greek? And probably no one did, but some poor soul was put forward to deal with those that were coming on board. He was the one that would fill out the ship manifest. They did not understand each other. Their languages were different. And that's why you get a lot of mistakes on the ship manifest. Most women are described as illiterate, which early on was probably the case, but certainly no Jewish man was illiterate. He may not have spoken the languages they were speaking, but he certainly was literate enough in his Hebrew to have his bar mitzvah. He was literate enough in Greek to be able to speak. And he probably knew maybe some French from the Alliance. He spoke other languages, but he didn't speak the languages of the ship. Names would be changed. It was not unusual for four brothers to come over and the spelling of their names were completely different. A prime example of this is among the Cochimeros. The name was actually Calcamera, which is the prayer that is said when you're separating the leavened products from the unleavened before the onset of Pesach. It became Cochimero in the United States. But the first brother that came over, Elias, came over with the actual family name of Matthias. We're running into problems now with those descendants of his who would like to claim Greek citizenship because nowhere in the archives of Yanada does he appear as a Colchimero. Only here later on in the United States did the, his name become Colchimero. There are also the instances of, uh, what's your name? A man pounds his chest and he says, Patera. Patera means father, and that's what was written down. Father, and that's how the family was known afterwards. There's also a misconception that names were changed at Ellis Island. No, at Ellis Island, they took the names straight off the ship manifest, and that's how they were registered. The, we're going to get to Ellis Island soon, and the, it was called the Island of Tears for a number of reasons. It was not a pleasant experience. This is Patra. This is what it looked like in 1907 when immigrants were going to, to the steamship. There would be little boats that they would get on that would take them to the steamship, that would take them to the United States. Now, not Everybody came into the port of New York. There were those that came into Boston. That was also a major port along the East Coast or Baltimore. There were other immigrants that went, came in through um, in Louisiana from um, New Orleans and made their way up the Mississippi River to Chicago. But the Yanoti Jews for the most part, most of them came into the port of New York with few exceptions. I love this picture. These are Greeks, not necessarily Jews, but the father is protecting the women in the family. God forbid any strange man should come over to speak to them. Very, very sheltered. They would come up out of the holes. Imagine being on these ships, crowded into the holes, in the stifling heat with no ventilation, in the winter with the cold, not even being able to go up on the decks afterwards, for three weeks, that was the typical journey, was three weeks at that time. Getting up onto the deck would give them a breath of fresh air, but it was still cold. I mean, those of you who have been out on the Atlantic Ocean on a ship, even in the summer, it can get quite chilly out there with the breezes. This is as the boat is coming into Ellis Island to land. Look at the crowds here. You know, it reminds me of the words on the Statue of Liberty, give me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This is of course a lithograph, but this here they're looking at the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York and the anticipation on their faces. This was the dream coming to the new world to make a better life for themselves and for their children. 
I often discuss why these immigrants, Jews from Yan and the left, what was different about their experience compared to Jews and non-Jews that came from other parts of the world. All immigrants pack their baggage, clothing, religious artifacts. If they have photographs, they bring that. They also pack their emotional baggage. And for many Jewish immigrants, especially Ashkenazim, that emotional baggage was the story of pogroms and persecutions. For Greek Jews, especially from Yanina, their emotional baggage was the hardship of leaving behind a world that they loved. Most of them would never go back. It was too costly. I often wonder what would happen with a mother where one of her children were ill. What's her decision? Does she go back with the child and leave the other children? Does the whole family go back? They can't let the sick child go back on their own. These were heartbreaking decisions that had to be made at Ellis Island. This is what Ellis Island looked like at this period of time as they came in. There was before there, there was Castle Gardens and there were immigrants that came in there before 1900. There was also a fire at Ellis Island in 1899. So the earliest immigrant, the Dakadia Yamtav, did not come into either Castle Garden or to Ellis Island. He came into a makeshift port that was being used for a short period of time until they could rebuild Ellis Island that had burnt down with, by fire. Getting off the ship, um, the look of the immigrants as they were coming in to a world that they knew nothing about. They had heard rumors, of course, the streets were paved with gold. Waiting, waiting for your physical, the anguish here, because you didn't know what would happen. The dreaded eye exam, because if they found red eye, pink eye, you would be turned back. It was highly contagious. Of course, it was not fatal, but you have to realize the United States in the, the late, latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century had a series of epidemics. There was yellow fever, there was diphtheria, there was many things that would cause mass deaths. Uh, a member of our community uh, who, from the Matza family, in fact, she uh, turned out to be the oldest person, her last name is now Goldstein, uh, in Las Vegas to get her COVID-19 test. She was born in 1918 during the influenza epidemic. And she posed a question. She wondered about the losses at that time. I'm researching this to see if there's any from our community at that time that actually perished from the influenza. Um, but it was devastating in New York. It's a reminder of we're going through now. It was a hundred years ago that the same thing was happening. Again, the dreaded eyes, you know, this was something there's, in fact, Hanula culture Merrill Cohn, according to the family lore, they put an X on her back. They, she was going to be sent back because they found a problem with her eyes. Her eyes were tearing and they thought that she had pink eye. Her very bright husband, Isaac Cohn, took his hand and put it over the X on her back to hide it from the people at immigration. So she passed and came in. These are what the halls look like on Ellis Island. Um, these, they're empty now, but at times they would be just filled with people learning to come in. There were so many things that happened. At one time, there was even um, women, young women who were coming in would be met by disreputable men who were gonna use them for prostitution. In fact, one of the early, uh, the League of Women Voters established a system where when there were Jewish immigrants coming in, there would be Jews that would be there to meet any single woman to make sure that nobody would come and abduct her. Uh, in the way that many other non-Jewish immigrants, women had been abducted. 
This was the world they found here. Now you remember the scenes back in Yanina. This was a typical street scene on the streets of the Lower East Side. Of course, you didn't see Hebrew writing in the stores in Yanina. You would see Greek writing in the stores. The carts that are used are not too dissimilar from the carts that were used back in Yanina. This is actually a beautiful um, painting that we had a man, uh, his last name is Lazarus, did for us. And um, we have copies of this anyone to, um, would like to purchase. This is the Lower East Side. Contrast, what I did now is I separated. On one side, you're gonna have what life was like in the old world. On the other side, what it was like very similar in the new world. Here you have a family environment. You have streets that are not crowded. You have people that you knew, languages that you understood. And this here, peddlers screaming out in all different languages, selling their wares. This is actually on Orchard Street over here. Hanging your laundry by the lake was quite different from hanging your laundry from the tenements on the Lower East Side. But this was not an uncommon scene where you couldn't even see the sky through the lines of the laundry that was being hung. Again, congregating in the streets, knowing people that you uh, were familiar with. And here is a, a man selling what looks like pretzels here on the Lower East Side. You know, forgive me, I can't see the, the people that you're blocking at have in my picture, but that's okay. Okay, remember the Taverna picture? Well, this is on the Lower East Side, that Long Island Street, there were clubs. This happens to be a Turkish club where there would be Turkish music and dancing. There were also Greek clubs where they would play Greek music. And further on, further west, there were all kinds of uh, music places that would show the, the different music of where they came from. There was Turkish. There was Egyptian, there was um, Greek, there was Ladino, the mixes. There were record companies that would produce these records and make a living from it because these were considered exotic and many people would buy this in the same way that there were books that were written by early immigrants. Many Jewish women who couldn't even speak the language had books published telling of their stories because their stories were considered exotic. Again, remember our water carrier? Well, if you wanted water on the Lower East Side, you had the fire hydrants. No fire hydrants back in Yanana. Bridges. This is a bridge not outside of um, Yanana in Zagoria. And this is the Williamsburg Bridge. Quite a different sight as you're walking through the streets. The outside of the synagogue in Yanina, the outside of our synagogue on the Lower East Side. You know, there were always shops on the bottom. Now the, the shops are mostly owned by Asians. Then it was mostly owned by uh, Jewish merchants. Again, the wedding. And here is a bar mitzvah. This happens to be Master Erwin Josephs, who was the son of Joe Josephs. And this is a very famous picture. There aren't many bar mitzvah pictures with the Greek flag in the background. Here's Erwin who has since passed away. This was in 1937. His father, Joe Joseph, Athena Gordis, the, uh, the uh, Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church, Rabbi Jesula Levi sitting over here. And this is uh, another rabbi. This is Rabbi Matzalek Matzal that's also sitting up on the dais. Contrast again. The streets of Yanana, the streets of the Lower East Side. This is Delancey Street. Quite different. You know, it amazes me how well so many of these immigrants adjusted, considering the stark differences from what they left behind and what they found here. But let's not be mistaken. This was not the case for everyone. 
There were a number of um, Jewish women from Yanina who committed suicide by jumping out of windows. It was not their dream to come over. It was their husband's dream and they follow him like dutiful wives would do. But where he would blend into the outside world, he was a businessman. He'd be out during the day. Their lives were cooped up in the tenement apartments. They had their small world they can communicate with. Most of them never really learned English. They hadn't gone to school. They couldn't read. Most of them, their education was cut off by the time they were 11, 12, 13, they were even lucky enough. The iconic lake, as compared to the East River, quite a difference, um, <laughs> quite a difference. Uh, this is when the East River was not that clean. Uh, I don't know, at this time, the lake was still where you could swim in the lake, but I doubt if you could swim in the East River at this time. But the differences in their reality, in their world. This is the inside of a traditional home in Yanina. Uh, it has been refurbished. The homes were such that there was a courtyard that you went into. And most of the time, the cooking was done outside. Then there would be staircases that would lead you up to the bedrooms. If you had money, there might be a what would be a, like a living room where the family could gather, a salon. But most of the houses were narrow and was, would really house a large family. Um, it was not unusual for a family of 11 to live in one of these houses. And when they came to the United States, it was not unusual for that same family of 11 to live in one of the two room tenement apartments. This is a typical tenement apartment on the Lower East Side. And very often the women in the family would engage in some form of sewing millinery to supplement the income. Uh, this would also happen among Yanoti Jews. Most of the women were quite good in sewing, but they wouldn't work outside the house. The men would very often set up their business um, within the apartment later on, maybe get together with a couple of brothers and start a factory in Lower Broadway. Again, always dealing with textiles. This is another here, small house in Yanina. And an apartment, this is actually from the Tenement Museum, one of the apartments there. The uh, stove would be a source of heat during the winter. And very often the bathtub would be in the, in the kitchen in these apartments. Back in Yanina, it wasn't much better, except there was fresh air, there was a garden to grow your vegetables and a well to get well water. Uh, but again, at this particular time, the beginning of the 20th century, there wasn't such a thing as indoor plumbing, either on the Lower East Side or in Yanina. Again, the houses, these were typical. If you look at the houses here, the architecture is Ottoman. The, oh, excuse me, the balconies. This was the Turkish families. The women would stay up on the balconies. They wouldn't come down. They would be secluded from the eyes of the world below. Jews very rarely were the builders of their own residences or their own synagogues. Usually the style was in the style of the indigenous population of the area using the material that was available there. In Yanina, most of the houses were in wood as they were up in Thessaloniki. These are traditional houses that date back from the early 1800s that are still in existence outside the Castro wall. Some of them even go as far back into the late 1700s. On the other hand, you have the Lower East Side here. This is actually our block and uh, fire escapes. The multiplicity of apartments going upward. You didn't have that in Yanina. One family lived in a house. If there were two floors, the upstairs were for sleeping, the downstairs was for living. 
I want to remind you at this point of other presentations that will be coming up. On the 15th, I'm going to be doing families, the basis of our institutions. And this is the Colter Merrill family that I've been talking so much about. This is a Jasula and um, uh, Julia Colter Merrill. Uh, this is Leon and, Ju and Julia Colter Merrill. And these are their children. Uh, there's, this is Max Bacola, who was not one of their children. He was actually a cousin that came over. The old lady, I have a feeling, was Rachel Colchamero, the mother of Leon. Then the last part of our three-part series is our gang. And this is going to be talking about Greek, Jewish, um, and the United Greek Jews in the United States Armed Forces during World War II. I'd like to also remind you that on the 14th of March, Sunday, at, that's this coming Sunday at 2 p.m. on Zoom, I will be with Professor Nicholas um, Alexio, and we'll be discussing Romano memories. We're going to be talking about emigration and immigration. Uh, Nicholas has done extensive interviews with Jews from Yanina who came over along as part of his Hellenic American uh, collection of um, interviews having to do with immigration. And I'm going to put some flesh, flesh onto the stories. I'm going to open up the um, to questions now. Ethan, if that's OK with you, dear, let me uh, get rid of my thing here. Oh, wait one second. If you want to reach me, my telephone number, the museum, this comes directly to me and, of course, our website. Marcia, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, as always. Um, and thank you all so much for participating. We'll take a few questions now. We have some time. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to ask to Marcia, please enter it into the chat box. If you haven't already, we're just going to spotlight Marcia here. There. Okay. Spotlight this um, beautiful, beautiful bridge behind me. <laughs> we already actually have a few questions here, which is wonderful. So again, if you have any questions, please feel okay. free to enter them into the chat. Um, one question here is interesting. Um, did everyone attend in Yanina or just in generally in Greece, the Allianz School? And for those who don't know, the Allianz School was the French Jewish school from the Allianz Israelite Universelle, which was an international organization in the Ottoman Empire. Did all, so did all um, the Jewish students attend the Allianz School, or was it limited to a specific group like rich or poor? A very good question. OK, the Allianz did not come to Yana until 1905. It came um, a good two decades earlier to uh, Salonika. But it was not until 1905 that it came to Yana. Um, yes, not everybody went. By the way, the classes were not the same for boys and girls. The boys would have secular studies that would supplement their religious learning that they would be having at the religious schools in the city. So they would have secular subjects. They would learn to read um, in Greek when it became part of modern Greece. But even before that, there were Greek classes and math classes, um, things that would set them out in the world of business. For the girls, it was um, sewing and French. You know, very, very important subjects to have you get a foothold in life. Um, but not everybody went. It was um, it was a matter of um, economics also, because young boys left school very early to help supplement the family income. So it was not unusual for a boy of 12, 13 or 14 to be finished with his education at that time. When I did the memorial book up, at the time, the community would number close to 2,000, and the close to 1,900 were victims from the Holocaust. Among those, there were only four professionals. Uh, there was an accountant. There was, of course, the rabbi. Um, there was a woman who was working which was as a teacher, which was very unusual for any woman to work outside the household. And uh, then the, there was also a male teacher. But out of that whole community, only four quote unquote professionals. So this was not an educated community. And what always amazes me is what happened when they came here. 
how it changed. Let's, let's go back to the Colchimeros. I mean, of those that came over, most of them had no education back in the old world. And yet they came here and they produced sons, daughters, and certainly grandchildren that were architects, professors, doctors, lawyers, dentists, um, and not only the men, but also the women. So the potential was there. And the reasons for coming to make a better life for their children certainly held true. It's a perfect transition, actually. Um, another great question that kind of connects is, um, what prompted people to make this huge journey across the ocean to the US? It really seems like a huge undertaking for them at the turn of the century. There was no opportunity back in Yanina. Let's go back to the Culture Merrill family again. I'm sorry, Elliot, I can't help it. But um, I mean, this is a perfect example. How are you going to start out in life as one, as uh, with, with the um, four brothers who have to provide dowries for their sisters and then raise enough money to start a family of their own? There was no opportunity for women. There was. Um, in fact, with the first generation, there was a lot of conflict with young women who wanted to attend colleges here because it wasn't part of the, the traditions of the community. In fact, if a girl was too educated, she would not be easy to marry off. Um, the, uh, it, it was a really opportunity, uh, educational opportunity, uh, uh, economic opportunity, and it was a war that uh, a world that was being torn by wars, changes in borders, and uncertainty. You had in 1913, when Yanida became part of modern Greece, there were a good number of Jewish families that left. They left before, for the reasons that I stated before. But you have to realize there were the Balkan Wars, and then there was World War One. Uh, there was also the exchange of population that took place in 1922-23. Their world was in an upheaval. And when the world was in an upheaval, uh, not only is the economics affected, but also the social ability is affected. Um, very often men were constricted to fight in armies that they had no desire to fight in. I mean, take Yanina. During the Balkan Wars, you could have men fighting in the Greek army against relatives that were still part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. So you had relatives fighting with each other. It was not unusual. All in all, it was, it, it was probably a shock to the system to come to the streets of New York and the tenements and the, um, the smells of the garbage, but they made the right decision. And also, when you think of the Holocaust, they definitely made the right decision. Another fascinating question here. Uh, how were the interactions or the relations of Greek Jews with the Christian Greeks in America and also with other Jewish denomination groups in the United States when they arrived? Excellent question. Who, who said that question? Who was that? That was Nicolas Alexio. Oh, that's who I'm going to be with next week. Of course, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, excellent question. They, in many ways, these Jews were not Greek enough for their Greek neighbors and not Jewish enough for their Jewish neighbors. Many of the Jews on the Lower East Side didn't believe this community was Jewish. They didn't speak Yiddish. That was the normal concept there. And even the Sephardic Jews that lived close by looked down upon this group of Greek speaking Jews, much in the same way as they looked down on them when they were in Greece. But there was a camaraderie based on language between the Greek-speaking Christians and the Greek-speaking Jews. Nicholas has done a fantastic body of work on identification, how you identify yourself. And for Greek Jews, that identification, even though, even to this day, I'll get the typical questions from many unknowing Greek Orthodox Christians when I say I'm a Greek Jew and they'll say to me, oh, one parent is Jewish and one parent is Greek. And I say, no. Oh, you converted? No. They don't understand that Greek is an ethnicity and Judaism is a religion. And you certainly can very comfortably fit in to the shoes of both those things. Um, but on the Lower East Side, 
There were many institutions that Greek Jews shared with their Greek Christian neighbors, certainly in the coffee shops that lined the streets of Allen Street. They would read the same newspapers. They would listen to the same music. And for most instances, except for the um, observance of kashrut, they would be eating the same foods. An early example of this, and Elliot, I'm going back to those Cochimeros again, okay? <laughs> Judith or Leon Cochimero, when he came over on most of the ship manifests, you can see what happened. Initially, something was written in and then it would be crossed out and they put down Hebrew. In other words, they found out the person was Jewish. They couldn't tell necessarily by the surname, but in speaking to the people, they found out they were Jewish and they would insert this. So it's very easy on those shift manifests to find the Jews because they're all listed as Hebrew. And this doesn't matter what country they come from. It doesn't matter whether they were citizens of the country or not. That's how they're designated. Judah or Leon Cochimero is listed as Greek. And what's interesting is right behind him on the line coming in, they left from Sherbon, is a Greek speaking man who had been in the United States before he was returning. And he probably knew the ropes. So he probably said to Leon, when they ask you, say Greek, because they were probably conversing with each other in Greek. That was the language of conversation. So he's the only one who came in and it says Greek on the ship manifest. I think we have time for one last question okay. here. There was a good question here um, regarding uh, Hebrew usage in Yanana. How widespread was the study of Hebrew in Yanana? And what was the observance like of Judaism in Yanana? Okay. Well, all boys would go to learn Hebrew for their bar mitzvah. There was not a Talmud Torah. If anyone wanted a higher education in Yanana, they went to Salonika, and that's where the rabbinical institutions were. Um, so the study of Hebrew was limited for the study for the bar mitzvah. Women would learn the Hebrew to say the prayers, but there wasn't that extensive. Now, the dialect that was spoken in Yanana among the Jews was a mixture of Hebrew, Turkish, and Greek. So a typical expression would be mashallah, which is Turkish, nasas rikso to talef. I shall throw the, ta the talef on you. And this was an expression that was said, God willing, I'll live to see you get married. And literally translated with that. So it was a mixture of the three languages. In their at no time in any language is Hebrew translated into the vernacular. So a talef is a talef. A shofar is a shofar. So in all dialects, the Hebrew words stay there. But uh, amongst the Yanina Jews, they were traditional. They were observant. They were religious. Um, and the early prayer books that were brought over here were all in Hebrew although we do have some that are in what is known as Judeo-Hebrew, which was the uh, Hebrew. It was actually Greek written in Hebrew letters. Okay, with that, I think that's all the time we have this evening, but I just want to thank Marcia so much for a wonderful first part in the three-part series on the exhibits of Greek Jewry. Uh, just so you all know, we're back here again next week, same time, same uh, same place, I would say, but same Zoom link in this case, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. As a reminder, this is a joint initiative, this uh, three-part series through the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood and Kehila Kedoshayanana, both of which are nonprofit institutions and that we do rely on your support. If you are able to at this time, we know it's difficult for many people, but if you are able to and willing, please consider making a donation or sponsoring a future class. We greatly appreciate it and make sure that all our programs can continue to be free for our communities and continue to be lovely and really interactive and really speak to our collective heritage. With that, I want to wish everyone uh, a good evening. Nochada uh, buena in Ladino, also a good evening as well. And inshallah, we'll see you all next week. Take care. Okay. Thank you.